Okay, morning everybody. So um, we stopped slightly in the middle of a section, so I've just reversed slightly and gone back to the statement of the theorem we were in the, in the middle of discussing. So um, in the first lecture, we focused primarily on binary trees. Okay, and uh, just at the end of the lecture, I started talking about the more general case of Bienname Gotten Watson trees, um, so which I'm going to call BGW trees for short. Okay, so we were in the middle of thinking about the family tree of a Bienname Gotten Watson tree conditioned to have total progeny n. So I've got n vertices in my tree, and I'm thinking about this as a rooted ordered tree. Okay, and um, we decided that we were going to use the graph distance to provide a metric on this space of vertices of the tree. Okay? And we also took the uniform measure mu n on the tree. Okay? And we were talking about this theorem, which says that if you rescale adequately, so if you rescale the distances roughly by 1 on square root of n, okay, there's a factor of sigma here to account for the standard deviation of the offspring distribution of my uh, gault watson process. Okay, then we got convergence in distribution to the Brownian continuum random tree in the sense of the gromov hasdorf prokhorov distance. Okay, and I was just talking through how one goes about showing this in general, so I'm not going to do the complete proof. We've gone into more detail in the case of binary trees than I will go into in general. But let me just remind you of a couple of the tools that we're going to use. So we saw already last lecture that it's useful to encode our trees in terms of discrete functions, and I'm going to do this in two different ways. So the height function and the depth first walk. And let me just remind you what these are. So suppose our tree's got n vertices, and let's label them v0, v1, up to vn minus 1 in depth first order. OK, so then the height function is simply how far are we away from the root of the tree. I always start my exploration at the root. How far are we away at step k of the exploration? OK, so that's just the graph distance between v0 and vk. So just on a little example, this looks like this. So hopefully it should be pretty obvious what I'm doing. I'm just exploring the tree in depth first order and recording how far I am away from the root. And it's easy to see that you can get back the tree from the height function. Now the depth first walk, it's slightly less easy to see that you can get back the other way. So let me first define it. So let C of, B the, C of V be the number of children of a vertex V. Okay, again we've got our depth first ordered vertices. Okay, so let's call x0 0, 0, and then in general let x only be the sum from j equals 0 to i minus 1 of the number of children of vertex vj minus 1. Okay, so in other words, the increment of this process x is just given by number of children of the vertex vi minus 1. And I'm going to think about this as representing the number of vertices that I'm sort of aware of but haven't yet visited. So let me do that on an example. OK, so I'm starting at 0, and I'm going to add on each time number of children minus 1. OK, so here that just stays flat. OK, but when I move now to 1, 1, so there's a single vertex of which I'm aware, the blue one, which I haven't yet visited. And so I'm putting on a stack to say, let's come back to it later. So effectively, x is giving me the size of that stack of things that I need to revisit later. OK? So every time I add on number of children minus 1, we can interpret it as the set of blue vertices, or the size of the set of blue vertices in this picture. OK, so if I continue, I always end up at minus 1, as I said yesterday, because I'm summing up the number of children and subtracting off n. OK. So proposition which it was an exercise that nobody got to, I think, on the example sheet yesterday, <laughs> um, was to show that you can actually get back the height process from the depth first walk. So I encourage those of you who've not seen this before to draw yourself some pictures and try and convince yourself of the truth of this statement. It takes a little bit of thinking about, but it's worthwhile. OK, so you can get back the height process from the depth first walk, and therefore you can get back the tree as well. So this does indeed encode the tree. OK, <clears throat> so the depth first walk of my BGW tree, I want to show that it's a stopped random walk. So remember that our offspring distribution, so this is a distribution on the non-negative integers, which is, has mean 1. And the proposition is that if I take a random walk with initial value 0 and step distribution, which is just a shifted version of this offspring distribution, so I'm just subtracting 1, OK, then if I set m to be the first time this random walk hits minus 1, 
If I compare that with the depth first walk of my Galton Watson tree stopped when I reach the end of the tree, so I've got total progeny n, which is in this case random, so then those two things have the same distribution. So um, this seems sort of a priori obvious, and then when you think about it a bit more, it sort of feels slightly less obvious. So if you'd like to see a careful proof of this, um, let me refer you to the survey paper of Lugal, which does it very carefully. So what I want to do now is condition on this total progeny n. I want to condition it to be equal to n, little n. And in order to do that, I'm going to suppose in this lecture that we have finite offspring variants. So the offspring distribution has variance sigma squared. So I've got a 1 here because the mean of my offspring distribution is 1. Okay. So if I do this, what have I got? So my depth first walk is now a random walk, which has got zero step mean and finite variance. And that's precisely the sort of thing that in the unconditioned setting, we expect to converge to a Brownian motion when we rescale in the correct way. Okay, so that's just Donska's theorem in this. So my total progeny is equal to the time that I first hit minus one. So what I want to do is I want to condition on the event n equals n. So let me make the standing assumption. It's not really necessary, but it's going to be convenient that the probability that n takes the value little n is strictly positive for all values little n. If that's not true, I just need to think down a subsequence of values n. Okay? And there's an example on the, on the example sheet, if you want to have a look at it, where in fact only odd values of n are positive. OK, so let's write xn of k for the depth first walk, which is conditioned to first hit minus 1 at time little n. OK, so then there's a conditional version of Donsky's theorem, which is due to k, which is an invariance principle for random walk, conditioned by a late return to 0. So notice we're doing something that's very unlikely here. We're conditioning it to come back very late on to sort of minus 1. OK, random walk in general <laughs> wants to come back pretty immediately. To or go pretty immediately to minus one. OK, so this is conditioning by an unlikely event. OK, so we get convergence here in the condition setting, not to a Brownian motion, but to the equivalent thing for the Brownian motion, which is a Brownian excursion. So a Brownian motion that I've conditioned again to do this unlikely thing of coming back at time one. OK, notice the difference between zero and minus one makes no difference here because I'm rescaling everything by one on the square root of n, so that vanishes in the limit. OK, and it turns out that roughly the same is true for the height process. So if I take the height process, which corresponds to this depth first walk where I've conditioned to come back to minus 1 at time n, then I've got the same relationship between the height process and the depth first walk. And it turns out, and I'm not going to prove this, that the height process, again, if I give it the same rescaling, so I rescale time by n and space by 1 on square root of n, then up to an appropriate scaling constant, I'm getting the same limit here, which I'm going to take to be twice the standard Brownian excursion because I took the convention that my Brownian continuum random tree was encoded by twice the excursion. OK. And then the convergence of the tree itself, with its metric and its measure, just follows in exactly the same way as we saw in the case of binary trees, except that I've now got a convergence in distribution in this theorem here. OK, so before we had an almost sure convergence in the binary tree case, so we could just use that sort of as an input into the argument for the gromov hausdorff prokhorov distance. Here, I'm going to need to use Gorohard's representation theorem in order to put myself on some abstract probability space where I've got an almost sure convergence and then use the same argument as I did in the previous section. OK, so... I hope this at least gives you some feel of why this result is true in greater generality than just the binary tree setting. And notice that in general we have convergence in distribution here rather than an almost short one. OK, so in fact the universality class of the Brownian CRT is quite a bit larger than just the collection of trees that I've talked to you about. So I've essentially only talked to you about conditioned genomic you know, Alton Watson trees. OK, but there are lots of other... Um, examples of trees which have the Brownian CRT as their scaling limit. Indeed, there are some things which aren't even trees to start with which have the Brownian CRT as their scaling limit. So here I've put some examples of trees which fit into this universality class, and there are many more that I haven't listed. Okay, so this thing really does crop up all over the place any time you've got a sort of uniform-ish random tree. Okay. So I want to move out 
move on now to talk about the critical editor engine random graph. Um, this is my aim to have smiley photos of all mathematicians, so this is my smiley photo of David Alders. <laughs> okay, so um, the stuff that I'm going to talk about in this section really comes from this paper of Alders's from 1997, and then I'm going to move on to some things that I did with uh, a couple of collaborators. Okay, so let me now remind you what I mean by the Odishrini random graph. So I'm going to take n vertices labelled by the integers 1 up to n, and between any pair of those vertices, I'm independently going to put an edge with probability p or not with probability 1 minus p. Okay, so here's a, a sort of simple example with 10 vertices. Okay. And I'm going to be interested in the connected components of the Odishrini random graph. So in my example, there are three of them. There's this rather connected thing up here, and then these two singleton components. OK, so as I expect most of you are aware, this model undergoes a phase transition. But let me just remind you what it says, or in case anybody hasn't seen it. So let's take the edge probability p to be c on n, where c is a constant. OK, so why is this a, a sensible thing to do? Well, every vertex has got n minus 1 possible neighbors, each of which is present with probability p. So this is the regime in which I'm getting an order one number of neighbors. OK, so this is the so-called sparse regime. OK, so let's take P to be C on N and consider the largest component. So what I've done is I've picked out its vertices in green and its edges in red so that you can see it a bit better. OK, so this is N equals 200 and C is 0.4. And you can see that as I increase the value of C, I'm getting a larger component with more vertices and more edges. And something rather dramatic happens as C passes through 1. And I go from occupying a sort of rather small proportion of the vertices to occupying a rather large proportion of the vertices and edges in this graph. Okay. So let me just say that by the size of a component, I'm going to mean its number of vertices. Okay. So if I take P to be C on N, then for C strictly less than 1, the largest connected component of my graph is small. So in fact, it's got size big O of log n, okay. whereas if c is bigger than 1, the largest connected component really is occupying a positive fraction of the vertices, so it's size big theta of n, and all of the others are little o of log n, so much, much smaller than this so-called giant component. Okay, so these statements um, hold with probability which converges to 1 as n goes to infinity. Okay, so this much was known to Erdős and Menyi in 1960. Okay. So let me just give you a heuristic picture of this phase transition. So I want to use the sort of logic that I was using earlier to say, why did we have sort of order one neighbors of a particular vertex? So we saw that vertex one, so it's just got a binomial n minus one c on n number of neighbors. So that's roughly Poisson c for large n. OK, so let's think about it as having a Poisson c number of neighbors. If I now think about picking one of those neighbors and asking how many neighbors it has that I haven't yet seen, well, now I've got a binomial n minus the number of neighbors of the first vertex that I've already seen, minus 1, c on n number of neighbors that I haven't yet observed. Okay. Again, each edge is present with probability c on n. And so this is still pretty well approximated by a Poisson c random variable as long as this capital N is small. Okay. I can kind of continue in this way. <clears throat> and what I'm seeing is that, sort of approximately, the component that I'm exploring is really basically a Poisson C branching process. OK. As long as the set of things that I've explored doesn't get too large. OK, eventually I'm going to feel the fact that I've got only n vertices to play with, but at least at the start, this is a pretty good approximation. And the point is that if C is less than or equal to 1, this branching process is just going to die out with probability 1. Right? So I'm going to explore a full component of my branching process, and then I'm going to sort of start again. I'll find some other new vertex to start from, and I'll again get another subcritical branching process. OK. On the other hand, if C is bigger than 1, there's some probability, some positive probability, that my branching process approximation is in fact going to live forever. OK, so obviously, if I start exploring and I'm in a branching process component that's going to live forever, eventually my approximation is going to break down. Right? But effectively, that's telling you that there is some large component in this graph. OK, <clears throat> so the branching process approximation there holds good until we explore the first component that doesn't die out. 
And then obviously we have to do something different. But at least the heuristic is telling you why c equals 1 is the right place to look at. OK, so c equals 1 is precisely the point of the phase transition for our branching process. OK, so if c equals 1, it turns out that the largest component has size on the order of n to the 2 thirds. And indeed, it's not any longer the unique component that's on that order. There's a whole collection of components, of largest components, which are on the order of n to the 2 thirds. So this is Nicolas Brutin's um, <laughs> critical random graph carpet. Um, so these are all the components of a critical random graph sort of put into a, a rug. OK, so our aim is going to be to try and understand this picture. Just different, ver different components of different colors in this thing. You might need to be up closer, Sergei, to see it. Sorry? Uh, well, I mean, it's acyclic with positive probability. No, yes, it is acyclic with positive probability, so it could just be a... I suspect there are some cycles and you just can't see them. <coughs> okay, so I want to do... So Let me just get some water. <coughs> we should have some. So I want to think slightly more broadly than just the critical point one on n. So it turns out that there's a whole critical window so where the probability p is equal to one on n plus lambda on n to the four thirds, where lambda is just some real valued parameter. OK, and for such values p, it turns out that the largest components have size, again, on the order of n to the two thirds. So if I want to see critical type behavior, this is the place to look. So I'm going to be interested in two things initially. I'm going to be interested in the sizes of the components and their numbers of surplus edges. So what is the surplus of a component? Well, it's simply the number of edges more than a tree that it has. So this is an example of a component with surplus three. So there are three edges here. I've picked them out in blue that I can remove and still get a tree. So still remain connected. But if I remove any more edges, then I won't get a connected object. And notice that these surplus edges are not uniquely defined. I could have picked a different set of three edges and had this still be true. OK, so let me fix lambda and let C1, C2, and so on be the sequence of component sizes of this graph listed in decreasing order. And let's let S1, S2 be the surpluses of those components. So not necessarily decreasing, because it might be that the largest component actually has surplus zero. OK. So let's put these in vectors as Cn and Sn. Then the theorem due to Aldous in 1997 is that as n goes to infinity, this pair of sequences, if I rescale the component sizes by n to the minus 2 thirds, and I leave the surpluses unaffected, converges in distribution to some limit pair of sequences. So let me say something about the topology for this convergence. I've got two sequences, so I really ought to be honest and tell you what I mean. OK, so for the first coordinate, we get convergence. So firstly, I listed my components in decreasing order of size. So I'd better be operating in a space of decreasing sequences. So that's what's going on here. OK, and these are going to turn out to be an L2. So I'm going to be looking at sequences which are square summable. OK, and the convergence is going to take place with respect to the usual L2 distance. <coughs> and then for the second coordinate, we're just going to get convergence so these are integer sequences. So I'm really just going to get convergence of the first finitely many, however many finitely many I pick. Right, so a way of encoding that is with this. OK, so I've just got integer sequences converging to one another. And what that says is they're going to be, for sufficiently large n, essentially equal in any prefix. OK, so how do I describe these limiting sequences? Well, I think this is quite surprising the first time you see it. So I'm going to start by taking a Brownian motion w, which I'm going to give a parabolic drift. So I'm going to add to it lambda t minus t squared on 2. So that looks something like this. So it's a Brownian motion sort of going around my parabola. Okay. And then I'm going to so subtract off its running minimum. Okay, so that has the effect of picking it up to stay above the x-axis. Okay. And then I'm going to decorate this picture 
with the points of a rate one Poisson process in the plane, where I'm just going to keep those points which fall under the graph of this process and above the x-axis. So I'm just keeping those that fall sort of under this picture here. Okay, so I can split up the path of this process into excursions above zero. Okay, so I've got open intervals here during which the process remains strictly positive. Okay, so if I take the maximum collection of open intervals here, that's giving me the excursion intervals of this process. So C has the same distribution as the sequence of lengths of these excursions listed in decreasing order, and S is the sequence of numbers of points falling under the corresponding excursion. Okay, so I need to find the longest excursion interval. It's probably this one here. Okay, so that's going to be the limiting size of the largest component when I've rescaled by n to the minus two thirds. Okay, and it happens to have three points fitting it, sitting in it. That's going to be the limit of my circle for that component. Now, it's a theorem that because I've got this parabolic drift, I can actually order these excursion lengths in decreasing order. There is, there is a longest one, and I can find it by looking sort of only finitely far along in time. Okay. So I want to show you why this is true, not least because it uses some of the techniques that we've been using in the context of our tree. OK, so again, a key tool is going to be a depth-first exploration. OK, so for a rooted ordered tree, we defined the depth-first walk in this way. So we started at 0, and we summed up number of children minus 1 for every vertex that we visited. OK, so we need to adapt this idea to a setting where we've got graphs with multiple components. We don't naturally have a root for each component, and we don't have ordered objects. So let me show you how to do that. <clears throat> so I'm just going to root each component as its lowest labeled vertex. That seems like a reasonable convention to take. And I'm going to use the vertex labels also to provide me with a sort of canonical ordering of the neighbors of a vertex. OK, so I'm just going to take the labels in increasing order. Now notice that there's no reason why these graph components should be planar. And in general, they won't be. But I'm not really going to care about planar embeddings of my graph because in a moment, I'm just going to pick out a spanning tree. Those trees are always. OK, so because we've no longer necessarily got a tree, I'm simply going to ignore any edges that get in the way. So I'm simply going to ignore any edge which leads to a vertex I've already explored. Okay? And that will allow me to pick out a spanning tree that effectively I'm exploring. So I'm going to start by exploring from vertex 1. So that will be the root of the component containing 1. Okay. And there's no need to stop when I hit the end of that component. I can just carry on adding on number of children minus one. So where do I go to once I hit the end of the first component? I'm just going to find the lowest labeled vertex I haven't already visited and start exploring its component. And I'll keep doing that every time I reach the end of it. So then what will XK represent? Is going to be the number of vertices I've seen but not visited at step K minus the number of components that I've already visited. Okay. So I'm just getting a minus one for every component that I've already completely explored. OK, so let's just see how this goes on a little example. So here I've got a graph which has got surplus two. So it's got two edges more than a tree. OK, so we're going to start exploring from its lowest labeled vertex. OK, so I've got neighbors five, six, and 10. The next one I'm going to visit is going to be the lowest labeled of those, so 5. And I'm putting 7 and 10 on my stack for consideration later. OK, so x1 is 2. And I'm going to continue in the same way, so going depth first. When I get to 3, I want to explore its neighbors. And I'm going to call 10 not a neighbor of 3 in the sense of my depth first exploration because I've already seen it as being the neighbor of 1. OK, so I'm just going to declare it to be a child of 1, but not of 3. OK, so I'm effectively just going to ignore this edge. And similarly, when I get down to 9, I've actually already seen its only unexplored neighbor, as a, again, as a child of 1. And so I'm just going to ignore this edge here. OK, and everything else just goes as normal. OK. So you can see that I've effectively just explored this graph as if the dashed edges weren't there. So our depth-first exploration and our labeling convention allows us to pick out 
just a particular spanning tree, which is effectively what we do the depth first exploration of. OK, and that gives us this depth first wall. OK, and if there are several components, if I ask what's the time at which I first hit minus k, well, that marks the beginning of the k plus first component. OK, so if I want to know the sizes of the components, I just need to look at these increments of the t process. So the t is the time at which I attain a new minimum. OK, and if I look at the increments of that process, that's giving me the sequence of component sizes. So that's clearly something that I can read off from this process f. OK, so in this way, we've encoded the component sizes in the process f. OK, so let's let xn lambda keep hold of the lambda position in the critical window. Let's have that be the depth first walk that's associated with the graph at the point lambda in the critical window. So then Aldous's theorem says that if you rescale time by n to the two thirds and space by n to the minus one third, then you get convergence and distribution to this Brownian motion with a parabolic drift. Remember, the drift is lambda t minus t squared on two. So, So B is the process that's reflected at its infimum. B lambda is reflected, but this is not reflected. I hope, that's, I, hope I was consistent in mind. I assume I was. <laughs> OK, so this is the, the process that goes to minus infinity. OK, so let me point out something here. So the scaling, although it's a little bit unusual to be thinking of n to the 2 thirds here rather than n, I have just got the usual Brownian scaling relation here in the sense that the, the space rescaling is the square root of the time rescaling. OK, so up to the fact that I've got n to the 2 thirds rather than n, this shouldn't look too weird that I'm getting a Brownian motion. OK, so let me give you a sketch of the proof of this theorem. So this is made more straightforward by the fact that the process xn is actually Markov. So it's time inhomogeneous, but it is Markovian. And so in particular, to understand its evolution, I really just need to think about what happens in a single step. OK, so what's happening at time i in this process? So I'm sitting at vertex vi, wherever that is. I've got i vertices that I've already completely explored. OK, so let's call those dead. I've got xi vertices which are alive, so things that I've seen but not yet fully explored. And I want to know the number of children of the vertex vi. What's its distribution? So I've not yet looked at possible edges from vi to any of the n minus i minus xni unexplored vertices. So those are possible places that I might have kind of new neighbors. Okay. And each of those edges is present just independently with probability p. So this is 1 on n plus lambda on n to the 4 thirds. Okay. So given xi, my increment or my number of children is just given by a binomial distribution with these two parameters. OK, so I want to be thinking about xn of i being little o of n. Right? So as long as I'm thinking about xn of i being little o of n and i being somehow on the order of n to the 2 thirds, so remember the time scaling I want to take is n to the 2 thirds. If I do that, the product of these two parameters of my binomial is looking roughly like 1 plus lambda on n to the 1 third minus i on n plus some error. OK, so approximately, if I look at my step conditionally on what I've seen up until time i in the process, well, it doesn't really end up depending on what I've seen up till time i. It just depends on how much of the graph I've eaten away and what is my parameter lambda. OK, so I've got a step distribution which is approximately Poisson 1 plus something minus 1. OK, so this is quite close to being actually a centred random walk, right? If I didn't have the lambda on n to the, fourth, uh, n to the one third minus i on n, this would be precisely a centred random walk. And we're just a little bit off. It's got a little bit of a time-dependent drift. But in particular, if I look at the process mn of i, where I take xn of i, and I subtract off the drift in each step, summed up from j equals 0 to i minus 1, well, firstly, that's approximately xn of i minus this thing. So we can just do this sum. Okay, so that's giving me lambda i on n to the one third, and then minus a term, 
which is just giving me approximately i squared on 2n. Okay, so that process is going to be approximately a martingale. Okay, so what have I done? I've just taken my steps and I've subtracted off the kind of cumulative drift in precisely such a way that I'm kind of centering my process. All right, so this is going to give me a martingale approximately. Okay, so if I plug in a time on the order of n to the two thirds, so like t n to the two thirds, and just to keep myself honest, I've given myself a flaw here because this had better be integer valued. Okay. So if I take this process mn and I rescale time by n to the two thirds and space by n to the minus one third, well, that's giving me the rescaled version of x and then minus lambda t plus t squared on two, which should hopefully look familiar as the drift in the Brownian motion. Okay, so since my Poisson distribution here has variance roughly one, I can just apply the Martingale functional central limit theorem which, if you haven't come across it, is just a more general version of Donska's theorem that applies to martingales rather than just random wall. Okay. So we, then we get that this process Xn appropriately rescaled, if I subtract off this sort of drift term, is converging precisely to a Brownian motion. Okay, so I can just shift this drift over the other side, and that gives me the result that I claim. Okay. But all that's going on here is that our depth first walk it's pretty close to being just a centered random walk, and it's got a little bit of a time dependent drift, which is gentle enough that in this time and space rescaling with n to the two thirds, n to the one third, I'm getting something which shows up as being order one. Okay. So that's roughly the argument that Aldous gives in order to show convergence of his depth first walk. So let me just say that Aldous worked breadth first rather than depth first. But it really makes no difference as all of the processes involved have the same. OK, so we now, roughly speaking, understand the limiting sizes and surpluses of the components of the critical random graph. I haven't really talked about how we prove the surpluses, but I'll come back to that in the next section. But what do these limiting components look like? OK, so the theme of the first lecture of my course was to be thinking about metric space convergence for these random trees, can we do something similar here? So in general, we haven't necessarily got trees here. I mean, some of these components may be trees, but others won't be. And again, we don't really care about the vertex labels. What we're interested in are the sort of geometric properties of these objects, shapes and distances and so on. So I'm going to give a metric space answer to this question. And I'm again going to use the gromov hausdorff prokhorov list. OK. So Let's think about the components one by one. OK, so here's a simple but important fact. If I take a component of the odish renyi random graph, conditioned to have a particular set of m vertices and s surplus edges, then it's simply a uniform random graph on those m vertices with that surplus, so in particular with m plus s minus 1. Right, so I'm looking at a uniform connected graph with those properties. So, in particular, if you give me the vertex sets of the components and you give me their surpluses, I'm in business. I can resample the rest of the graph. And okay, I'm going to use that fact and sort of pass it through to the limit. So let me talk about connected graphs. Um, so this is joint work with Luigi Dario Berry and Nicola Boutin. And I don't think any of us are still at the university we were at when we wrote the paper. But anyway, this is where people are now. Um, so we wrote two papers on this and then a third with Gregory, which I will um, refer to a bit later. OK. And again, I managed to find them smiling. OK. So let's fix a k greater than or equal to 0. And let gn of k be the uniform connected graph with vertices labeled by 1 up to n and n plus k minus 1 n, so precisely with surplus k. OK, so if I take k to be 0, 0 surplus just gives me a tree. So this is precisely a uniform random labeled tree. So that fits into the context of earlier, right? so uniform labeled tree. We saw that was basically a Poisson BGW tree, okay, conditioned to have total size n and given its labeling. So in particular, the k equals 0 case, we already know what its scaling limit is. It's the Brownian continuum random tree. The question is, what happens with k not 0? So again, let's write d and k and mu and k for the graph distance and the uniform measure on the vertices. So then our theorem is effectively that there exists 
a random compact metric measure space dk dk mu k, which is the scaling limit, when I do exactly the same rescaling that I did in the case of a uniform random. So I'm just going to rescale distances by one on square root of n, and I get convergence in distribution to some limit, which I'm going to give an explicit description for now. Okay. So we saw a tree which was encoded by a standard Brownian excursion. And I now want to sample a different sort of excursion function, which is related by absolute continuity to the Brownian excursion. So I'm going to take a standard Brownian excursion. I'm going to define a new excursion, e tilde k, so again from 0, 1 into r plus, by doing the following thing. So I'm just going to reweight the distribution of my standard Brownian excursion by its area, so the integral between 0 and 1 of the excursion function itself, by its area to the power k. OK, so the easiest way to write this down is to think about the expectation of a test function of the process. OK, and I'm just reweighting its distribution by this factor of the area to the power k. In order to get probability distribution, I need to renormalize on the bottom by the expectation of that area. OK, so let me just give you a moment to stare at that, because it's perhaps presented in a slightly unfamiliar feeling way. OK, so this is just biasing my excursions towards those which have slightly larger area. How much larger will be a factor of area to the power k? OK. So I can use, again, I'm going to take this convention that my trees are going to be encoded by twice the excursion function. So let me take 2 e tilde of k, and let's use it to encode a continuum random tree. So this is going to be t tilde k, just in exactly the same way as we did with the Brownian case. OK, so this is my sort of little sketch of what the distances are doing in this tree. OK, and then I'm going to do one more extra thing. I'm going to sample k independent uniform marks in the area under this excursion. So here I'm taking the example k equals 3, and I've just sampled three points in this area under the curve. Right, so these are just uniform in the area under this curve. And each of these marks picks out two points in the tree. Okay, so it picks out a point up the top and a point somewhere down the middle. Okay. And I'm going to glue them together or identify them. So you have to imagine taking these points here and sort of bending the tree around and gluing it to itself at the red points, at the green points, and at the two blue points. So you can see how this is going to create cycles in the object that I've obtained. It's not going to matter, but I've taken the convention that I'm going to go the easiest way <laughs> in my picture, so it won't matter. But uh, if you would like a convention, just take go right. That's what I'm about to do in a moment. OK, so let me do this uh, sort of a little bit formally, although I suspect that the picture is going to have more meaning than the formulae. OK, so we've got our projection from 0, 1 onto the tree. OK, we get by <coughs> just, well, well, what are we doing? We're quotienting out by the points where this, this, this pseudo distance is zero. OK, so we've got marks. Let's call them x1, y1 up to xk, yk, so which are just in the area under this excursion. OK, and then just <coughs> let me take as a convention that I go right. So let's let ti be obtained as the first value t, which is greater than the x-coordinate of my point, such that I hit the the excursion, 2 e tilde k. OK, so, so let me say, so here we've got our y coordinate, OK, and I'm just going to go across far enough that I find a point of the function which is equal to the y coordinate of my point. OK, OK, and I'm going to call that pi. And so then I'm just going to define a new equivalence relation on my tree now, OK, which just puts x, so xk of, sorry, pi k of xi and pi k of ti to be equivalent to one another, okay, and then quotient out by that equivalence relation. So this is just identifying the points which are coded by xi in 0, 1 and ti in 0, 1, okay, and it just glues them together. And then let's let dk be the metric and mu k be the measure which are induced in the sort of, I hope, obvious way from the original tree. So what have I done to the distances? 
If I've just glued two points together, it may be that the shortest path from one side of the sort of gluing to the other side of the gluing now goes through that gluing point. But I've only made k changes to my tree. So hopefully you can see that this is going to reorganize my distances inside this object, but not in a very complicated way. OK, so I might potentially have a shortest path which now goes through various of those vertex, vertex identifications, but I've only made finitely many of them, so I'm not going to mess things up. Very much. OK, and the measure really does just stay pretty much as it was before on the tree. OK, so what does the scaling limit look like? Well, it looks like a graph that looks like a Brownian continuum random tree. <laughs> so, so we had that our underlying tree, the sort of spanning tree of a component, was something which was absolutely continuous with respect to the Brownian continuum random tree, so it ought to look pretty similar. OK, and I've just made some vertex identifications, and here I've made four of them. OK, so how do we prove this? Well, back to the depth-first exploration, which I guess is the theme of these lectures. So when we explored a component of the underlying graph Let's suppose we've got a connected graph G and we just think about the depth first exploration that we do of it. We effectively just explored a spanning tree and we ignored these two dashed edges that I've shown on the screen. So let's give this spanning tree a name. Let's call it the depth first tree, the tree that we got from doing a depth first exploration. Okay, and let's write T of G for the spanning tree that's associated with a graph G. So X, my depth first walk, is also the depth first walk of this tree, right? Because I ignored these dashed edges. So let me try and look at things the other way around. Let's start from the tree and say which connected graphs have that as its depth first tree. Okay. In other words, where might I put surplus edges in order to create a connected graph? Okay. So let's call such edges permitted. So edges which won't change which is my depth first tree. OK, so let's have a look. So let's do the depth first exploration again. So the dashed edges are edges that I might put in without changing the depth first tree. Okay, so if I had an edge from here to here, or from here to here, I wouldn't include it because I've already observed 7 and 10 as neighbours of 1. Okay, so these guys, even if they were present, I would ignore them. And similarly, if any of these edges were present from 2 to, I can't actually read that, 7, 10 or 9, I would ignore them because those are vertices that I've already observed along the way. OK, so you can see that these permitted edges are precisely those from wherever I'm currently exploring the vertices which are sitting on the stack, vertices I've seen but not yet explored the neighbourhood of. So at step k, there are x of k permitted edges. Right? There's precisely one permitted edge, edge per blue vertex, per vertex that's sitting on the stack. And so the total number of permitted edges is this quantity, so the sum of the xk's across the whole of the excursion. Okay, so we're going to call this the area of the tree, precisely because it's the discrete area under the depth first wall. Okay. So if I let gt be the set of connected graphs g such that they have depth first tree t, okay, then, well, how many such graphs are there? are just 2 to the a of t, because every single one of these permitted edges can either be included or not. Okay, so that's just how many graphs there are that have that as their depth first tree. Okay, so let's let t square brackets n be the set of trees that have label set the first n integers. So then I can partition the set of connected graphs on those vertices just by depth first tree. Okay, so first take the depth first tree and then ask how many graphs do I get by adding in permitted edges. And that splits this up into disjoint. OK, so this gives us a way of thinking about generating a uniform connected graph. OK, so remember, I want one that's got surplus k. So first, I'm going to pick a random label tree, p tilde k, no longer uniformly, but with probability which is proportional to a of t choose k. Okay, so the number of different ways of choosing a k set from A of T. Okay, and then I'm going to choose a uniform k set from among the permitted edges for that particular tree and add them to the tree. Okay, and you can see that by combining these two operations, what I'm getting is simply a uniform connected graph with 
case at present. So in order to understand the scaling limit of this uniform connected graph with surplus k, what do I need to do? I need to show that this tree converges in the usual sense to an R tree encoded by my excursion, or P 2 t 2 e tilde k. And the locations of my surplus edges converge in some sort of nice way that I can. OK, so let's do the first of those two things. Let's think about the tree. So we've got an associated depth first walk. So let's think about the behavior of this area quantity. OK, so the area of my tree t tilde kn, so that's just the sum of the points of the depth first walk over the course of the excursion. OK, and I can write that as an integral, just in this way. And then let me change variable in the integral. I'm going to change variable by multiplying this s by, or rather say, taking s to be n times u. And then I get a Jacobian associated with that. And I've just pulled out an n to the 3 halves and put an n to the minus a half in here so that I've got things scaled in the way that I want them to be. OK, so. I'm thinking that this is going to be an order one quantity multiplied by n to the 3 half. OK, so if t were a uniform random tree and xn were its depth first walk, then I'd be getting convergence to a standard Brownian excursion. So what I want is the measure changed version of that statement in this situation rather, where rather than taking a uniform tree, I've taken a tree with probability proportional to area of the tree choose k. OK, so firstly, let me say that in the case of the depth first walk of a uniform tree, if I were to take the equivalent quantity to this, I'd just be getting convergence in distribution to the integral of the Brownian excursion just by the continuous mapping. OK, so let's use the change of measure. OK, so the change of measure told me that to get the tree that I was interested in, I should take a uniform tree and reweight its distribution by area choose k. Okay. And I can do the same change of measure to the associated depth first walk. Okay. So the depth first walk of my tree is going to be the depth first walk associated with a uniform tree reweighted by area choose. Now, what happens to area choose k if I rescale by n to the minus 3k on 2? <laughs> right. So this is something which is roughly. This quantity on the top of the power k divided by k factor. Okay, I'm rescaling here by something which is going to send minus 1, minus 2, and so on to 0. This is just going to look like a power of the area. Okay, so this quantity converges in distribution simply to the area to the power k divided by k factorial. Okay. So in particular, I can think about just dividing top and bottom by this n to the minus 3k on 2. And that's going to send this thing to that, and it's going to send this thing to that. Okay. So in order to conclude that an expectation converges, I'm also going to need uniform integrability. Right? It's not going to be enough just to get convergence in distribution of these quantities, but I'm not going to go through the fiddly checking that that works. So let me just assert that we have sufficient uniform integrability that this works. So what do I get? I get that my depth first walk of the tree that I'm interested in, on appropriate rescaling, converges indeed to this tilted Brownian excursion. So it's Brownian excursion whose law I've reweighted by its area to the power. OK, so that works for the depth first walk. And we saw that we had this way of converting a depth first walk into a height process. And okay, that works just as well here. And once I've done that conversion to the height process, I can then get convergence of my trees in the usual gromov hausdorff property. OK, so once we've got this tool of the depth first exploration at our disposal, we can then use it to deduce the convergence of the tree in the appropriate way. OK, so this really is just the analogue of the argument that we did in the case of the Brownian continuum random tree. It's just I've reweighted everything along the way. OK. Sorry? K is of order 1 in this, so I'm very much thinking of K as a fixed integer. Okay. Mu and K is just the uniform measure on the vertices of my graph. 
So I've tried to put the things that are not converging in the superscript and the things which are converging in the subscript. So this is the, this is the uniform measure associated with this tree. So this is the push forward of the Lebesgue measure on 0, 1 onto this. Thing. Okay, so this is a tree which is encoded by my tilted Brownian excursion, E tilde K, okay, in the usual way. Okay, and it has a natural measure associated, which is just the push forward of the Lebesgue measure, and that's this thing. Okay. So the permitted edges, these possible dashed edges that we saw, these are in bijective correspondence with the integer points under the graph of our depth first wall. Right? So we can actually use that fact in order to get this convergence. So let me um, put it like this. So these two permitted edges here are going to be represented by these two red dots here. Right? So there's a unique way of associating an edge with a point under this graph. Okay, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to pick a uniform K set from among the permitted edges. Okay. So what do we get? We just get k points chosen uniformly at random from among these red circles. You can kind of see that that's going to have to converge to just a uniform, a, a k uniform picks from under the area under this excursion. Everything is scaled in the right way so that that works. Out. Okay. And this also tells us why we get convergence in Aldous's picture for the number of surplus edges. So just thinking back to the whole graph, so he's got this way of thinking about these things occurring just as as points along the way, and it's precisely this same picture. We're getting a Poisson number of points in general under each excursion because we're thinking there in general not of fixing the number of uh, surplus edges, but of allowing that to be something also that arrives randomly in our program. Okay, so finally, these surplus edges, so if you think back to my picture of where the vertex identifications are, uh, occurred in the limit picture, they always were from somewhere that was a leaf in the tree down to somewhere along the sort of path to the root. And that's kind of almost true in the discrete picture. So where are these surplus edges going? Well, they're going almost to ancestors. In fact, what they go to is a younger child of an ancestor of my current vertex. So here's my current vertex. And these are all sort of younger children. They're all further right than the ancestor of my current vertex. But the point is that only a distance one off. And an edge of length one, well, when I rescale, that's going to become an edge of length one on square root of n, it's going to vanish as I take the limit n to infinity. So something that's sort of just off this path to the root, in fact, ends up being on it in the limit. Okay, so when we rescale this distance between a vertex and one of its children vanishes, and so in the limit, these surplus edges really are going down to an ancestor of whichever vertex I'm currently visiting. And these marks corresponding to the surplus edges, when I rescale them, straightforwardly converge just to these uniform points under the curve. OK, so if you take care with all of the details, that completes the proof of the convergence of a uniform connected graph with surplus. OK, so we now understand what's going on in a single component of our Erdős Renyi graph. And we now want to put everything back together and try and understand the full graph picture. So let me remind you of the setting. So we're sitting in the critical window. We've got our decreasingly ordered component sizes, and we've got our surpluses which correspond to those components. And Aldous's theorem told us that if we rescale the component sizes by n to the minus two thirds, and the surpluses not at all, then we get convergence in distribution of that pair. Okay, so we now want to think about every component in this graph as being a metric space. Okay, so these are these script C1, C2. So the size, the number of vertices of C1n, this script C1n is just going to be Cin, C1n. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to take each of these little graphs with its graph distance. Okay, now it's going to be slightly complicated to take the uniform measure on each of these things because they've got random sizes. So instead of that, I'm going to take the counting measure, so the measure which just counts how many vertices there are, and I'm going to rescale it by n to the two thirds. So sizes are on the order of n to the two thirds, 
Rather than rescaling by the actual size of the component, I'm just going to rescale by its sort of order of magnitude, so into the two thirds. So this is going to give me something which is not a probability measure in the limit, but which is a finite measure. OK, and that's just a more convenient. OK, so I've got the components thought of as little metric spaces with their distances, and each has got a counting measure associated, so that when I apply the counting measure of the ith component to the ith component, it gives me its number of vertices ci. OK, so then our theorem says that if you jointly with this convergence of the sizes and the surpluses, what you get is so the first component where I rescale distances by n to the one third, and I rescale the counting measure by n to the two thirds. So if I take the whole sequence of those, then I get convergence in distribution to a sequence of limiting metric spaces. Okay. So such that, firstly, the size of the ith limiting metric space is the length of the ith longest excursion of Aldous's limit process. Okay. And if I condition on the sizes and the surpluses, then I've got precisely a uniform graph with that surplus, okay, where I've slightly rescaled things to deal with having a different size. Okay, so I've rescaled the counting measure by the size of the component and I've rescaled the distances by square root. Okay. So I've got this kind of canonical family of graph scaling limits, one for each value of the surface. Okay. But I'm not getting size n to the two thirds one precisely. I'm getting some, some random size times n to the two thirds, and I need to account for that in my measure and my distance. Okay. So I know that's a bit of a mouthful, and I also realise, looking at Gregory, that this theorem is not stated like this in that paper. It's stated in our joint paper on the minimum spanning tree in this way. But anyway, um. <laughs> um. okay. So let me just pause there because I think that's quite a mouthful to take in, and let me just let you kind of absorb it. Okay. Sorry, I can't hear. I don't have a tilde anymore, right, because this is the measure on the graph rather than on its spanning tree. Okay, so I put the tildes on the spanning trees, okay, and then I made my vertex identifications and that lost the tildes. Working on the principle that one should always remove notation rather than put extra on. Okay. These are the size, so the length of the excursion which encodes the thing. Well, they're not constants, they're random quantities. They say so they're the sizes, they're these lengths of these excursions of Aldous's limit process. But if I condition on them, yes, you can just treat them as numbers. Because there is no smallest component. So there is a largest component, but there's no, there's no first, there's no first excursion of a Brownian motion. No. So I need this convention in order to make sense of this statement, in fact. Or I need something like this in order to make sense of the things that I'm talking about. There's no leftmost component, exactly. <laughs> okay. So I thought I would finish up just with some pretty pictures. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, because I want to tell you something about where this goes. So th this was work that we did with Luigi and Nicola in 2012, and obviously there's been quite a lot of time since then, some of it in a pandemic. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to show you some of the, the sort of more general things that one can do. So let me just um, talk to you first about universality. So just as in the Brownian continuum random tree, we saw that there was this whole family of random trees that converged to the Brownian continuum random tree. It wasn't just BGW trees, it was this whole family of things. And very similarly, it's not just the case that the Erdős-Rényi random graph is the only random graph model that has this scaling limit. There's a sort of family of scaling limits associated with essentially these parabolically drifted Brownian motions. You can do various things with sort of changing the drift and changing the, um, the sigma squared slightly. Um, but that gives you a collection of models which are roughly sort of Brownian, if I can put it that way. Okay, so examples that fall into this universality class 
of random graphs which are generated according to the configuration model, if that means anything to you, or inhomogeneous random graphs under various conditions. Okay, so we need rank one here. So in each of these cases, somehow the important feature of the, of the graph that's necessary is that we have a finite third moment for the empirical vertex degree. And that's corresponding essentially to having finite variance for the offspring distribution in a tree. Okay, so you can think about these things as somehow being graphs which are related to branching processes. And if you've got finite third moment for the empirical degree distribution, that's going to give you a finite second moment in the sort of approximating branching process offspring distribution. Okay, so. Yeah, so it's because we visit things in a size biased random order, and so third moments become second moments of that size biased distribution. So coming back to trees, what happens if you don't have a finite offspring variance? Well, we could ask what happens if we've got a critical offspring distribution, which is in the domain of attraction of a stable law. OK, so critical means it needs to have a mean. So the possible stable laws we'd be looking at have an index alpha between 1 and 2. And it turns out that there you do get scaling limits, which look a little bit more exotic than the Brownian continuum random tree. So these are the stable trees again with Igor's lovely pictures. Okay, so there's a family of different possible scaling limits there parameterized by essentially the tail behavior of your offspring distribution. So that's what this alpha describes. Okay, and let me just observe that there's an analog of Remy's algorithm, which is due to Philippe, wherever he's gone, over there. Um, and there's also a more complicated line breaking construction that uh, Benedict Das and I wrote down a few years ago. Okay, so again, you can construct these trees by sort of chopping up the positive real line and sort of gluing sticks together. Okay, and well, that then leads you to ask, well, if you've got a scaling limit for um, off, uh, branching process trees with offspring distribution in the domain of attraction of a stable law, is there a kind of graph analog of that? And the answer is yes. Um, so... There's actually much more is true than I'm telling you on this slide. These graphs can get sort of enormously complicated, but there's a collection of things which we've called the stable graphs. Um, so if you take a configuration model with IID degrees, which have got a certain power law tail behavior, then you can cook up a collection of random graph models which have sort of measure change stable trees sitting at their heart. Okay, so there's a sort of stable tree analog of the graph picture. Um, then something else which is related to these erdos random graphs is um, a paper to which I already referred on the scaling limit of the minimum spanning tree of the complete graph. So let me just take a couple of slides to tell you this problem, firstly because I think it's pretty, and secondly because otherwise you'll have no idea what I'm on about. So <laughs> let's take the complete graph on n vertices. Okay, so let me just make an observation. The erdos graph is what happens if you take the complete graph and you do percolation at parameter p, right? So I keep every edge with probability p and discard it otherwise. That gives you the odish renyi graph. OK. So if I think about the complete graph on n vertices, let's give it iid random uniform edge weights, OK? And then pick out the spanning tree of minimum weight. OK, so in this picture, that gives you... OK, so what does a large... Spanning tree of, sorry, what does a spanning tree of a large complete graph look like? Okay, so in particular, does it have a scaling limit? So this is a picture of a large minimum spanning tree. And the answer is yes. Okay, so if I take the minimum spanning tree of the complete graph on n vertices, and I again do the usual thing, so I take the graph distance, the n, and I take the uniform measure on its vertices, then the theorem that Luigi, Nicola, and Gregory and I prove um, is that there exists. A scaling limit, in this case, with a rescaling which is different, n to the one-third rather than n to the half. Okay, you get convergence in distribution to a random real tree which is binary, but in contrast to the Brownian tree which has fractal dimension 2, this has fractal dimension 3. Okay. And I wanted to mention this because the key to understanding this result, really, is a connection between the erdos renyi random graph and Kruskal's algorithm for building the minimum spanning tree. And so let me just say that this n to the third here really is the same n to the third that we just saw in the components of the critical Erdos-Renyi random graph. 
Okay, so if you'd like to know more about that, that's the reference to the paper. Okay, and then I just wanted to finally mention some very recent work with Robin Stevenson, who's somewhere there, <laughs> so close that I can't see him, um, on random directed graphs. So we talked about the Erdős Renyi graph, which doesn't have oriented edges. But you can ask the same question in the context of the directed random graph. So what's the simplest directed random graph model? Take n vertices and take every possible directed edge to be present independently with probability p and absent with probability 1 minus. Okay, so that gives you a perfectly good directed graph model, dnp. Okay, so let's now think about the strongly connected components of that graph. So those are the subsets of vertices such that between u and v, I think there's a directed path from u to v and back from v to u as well. Okay, so those look quite thin. Right? These are what strongly connected components of such a graph look like. Okay, so they've got this natural kind of cycle structure to them. Okay, and it turns out that the NP also undergoes a phase transition, which sort of from a distance looks very much like the erdos renyi transition in the sense that it occurs at p equals 1 on n. Below the point of the phase transition, you've only got microscopic strongly connected components. And above the point of the phase transition, you've got a unique giant strongly connected component. But at the point of the phase transition, you get something that looks rather different. So, which is maybe indicated by the previous page. So these things don't look at all like Brownian continuum random trees, which is sort of what the critical Erdős-Rényi components look like. Right? They look rather like sort of collections of loops attached to one another. And really the correct analogue is the kind of cycle structure within a critical Erdős-Rényi graph. Okay, so rather than thinking about the whole thing with its kind of trees hanging off, if you think about just extracting the cycle structure, you get something that looks a little bit like this. And something analogous is going on in the critical directed random graph. Okay, so we used, again, a depth-first exploration and similar tools in order to prove a scaling limit in that setting, where the components now have sizes and lengths, which are both on the order of n to the one. Okay, and that seems like a good place to stop. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Christina, for this uh, very nice lecture. Are there any questions? <coughs> okay, just wait for the mic. Thank you for this lecture. Uh, I'm not familiar with the being in the domain of protection of uh, if it's alpha stable low, what does it mean? So we've got infinite variance, but we've got tail behavior, which is still sufficiently kind of gentle to give us the possibility of a finite mean. And so okay. if we've got a polynomial tail behavior which allows us those two things, then necessarily we're going to, I'm going to get the index wrong if I try and say it out loud. So, um, but um, so then you're going to get convergence to one of these so-called stable laws. So there's a whole family of these things. And we're actually looking at a particular sort, so one-sided stable distributions, because we've got this property that, if you think about the depth first walk, it's always making a sort of jump which is a random quantity minus one, mm -hmm. right? So we're always getting these things sort of being possibly large in the up direction, but at most, that so we go down by at most one. Okay, and so that tends to give us these stable distributions which have a particular skew to the right. Okay, thank you. I don't know if that was useful. But. Other questions? <laughs> okay, people who didn't ask questions before, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you okay, Marie? Um, is it easy to capture a cyclicity of the graph with this method? Uh, so, I mean, we can just ask the question. So, what's the probability if we take Aldous's picture? What's the probability that we get no points? Okay, and so this is going to have probability zero that we hit. So, so if you scale by n to one third. Like the probability a graph is a cyclic is n to the minus one third times a function of lambda. Is it possible with this method to obtain um, some kind of behavior or some properties? No, we've really washed away the. Okay. We've washed away these things which have got okay, I hope I will asymptotically zero probability. Hopefully, I can convince yeah. you. The I think I said something wrong along the way, by the way, which is that I mean, so so this thing is always going to have 
countably infinitely many unicyclic components, right? So I'm, I'm always going to have, so it's, it, it might potentially be a planar object, or it might potentially have no components of higher complexity, but it's always going to have infinitely many. My Erdős-Rényi graph is always going to have infinitely many unicyclic components. Do you, how, how bad would it be to have k large, k the surplus? Can you make k scale with n in a mild way such that your estimates for it tilde don't break down instead of taking that uh, constant? Um, I suspect there are people in this room who know the answer to this question, and <laughs> I don't standing here. Um, but I mean, if you want, you can think about these as unicellular maps. So, I mean, there's, it, it's sort of a, or, or similar to the kind of maps with, with few faces, right? So this is also a question about what happens when you've got, um, you can think about taking embeddings of them, and it's a similar question there in the map setting. What's going on when you've got... No, these guys are not planar. These guys are not planar. No, no. Uh, do, do you really have estimates in which you see... So, I, you, you are putting under the carpet a lot of, I have to check that things don't go badly yeah. in approximation of I don't, of have, I don't have good enough errors to do the sort of thing that you're describing. What I was asking is mm. not a thing that one can think in one second, but mm. maybe if you look at what we are really calculating and don't think K as a constant anymore, what is the largest scaling yeah. of K we can such that in every point in which something has to be small, things don't break down. Yeah. So I, I don't know the answer to this question, but maybe let's take it offline and have a think about it. No more questions? So if not, let's uh, thank Christina again for a fantastic set of lectures. And